Hey guys, welcome back to my CCNA 200 301 course. Patrice is here and in this video we are going to start our Spanning Tree Protocol journey. Are you ready? Let's get started. Spanning Tree Protocol or STP is a very easy to understand topic, but it has a lot of details which at the beginning of the learning might seem to be confusing. So what I would recommend you is be patient with STP. Watch this video and the upcoming ones multiple times, read about STP, watch other videos from other providers, etc. But just be patient, you will get to that point to figure out STP is very, very easy protocol. As I mentioned in the previous videos, and we were talking about Ether channels, Spanning Tree Protocol is a protocol that helps us to create loop-free layer 2 topologies. So if you have redundant links between your switches, and you uh, do not uh, want to use them as a re like a ether channel communication, etc. This is the spanning tree role to actually block the redundant path in the network, so you don't have loop in your layer two topology. In CCNA 20301 course, we will be talking about two flavors of STP which both introduced by IEEE. First one is STP, and the standard number is 802.1D, and the second one is called Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol, and the standard number is 802.1W. I'll be talking about the difference between these two protocols in the upcoming video. Cisco has made a little tweak in these two uh, protocols and implemented them per VLAN. So it is PVST plus or per VLAN spanning tree protocol and RPVST plus or rapid per VLAN spanning tree protocol. So within Cisco switches, we are running a spanning tree protocol or RSTP per VLAN, which means there is a separate instance of STP protocol or RSTP protocol that is running per VLAN. And all calculations and whatever I will be talking about, it will be happening per VLAN. First of all, let's see what would happen if we have loop or redundant path in our layer two topology and we don't have a spanning tree that can control this. The first thing that would happen is called broadcast store. Let's assume that PC1 wants to send something to PC2, but it doesn't have its uh, MAC address to put it in the destination. So the first thing gonna be an ARP request to the switch. ARP request is basically a broadcast message. So it will actually be broadcasting to all switch interfaces, except the one that is getting received on. And so switch two will receive this broadcast message. And so um, it has to do the same thing. So it has to send the broadcast message on all interfaces except the receiving one. So for this message, it will actually be broadcasting it on this one and this one. And for this message, it will again broadcast it on this one and this one. Again, another broadcast message will receive here and this switch replicate the scenario. So after a quick uh, time, there would be a lot of broadcast messages that going between these two switches. And these broadcast messages impose a lot of load on the switch CPU. And after a few minutes or so, depends on the actual capacity of the switch and also the, how big is your network, how much broadcast messages do you have. Um, the CPU of these two switches will actually kind of uh, choking and then your network will be down. So the first thing, and I think it's the worst thing that can happen, is called the broadcast storm. And you can see that how it can impact your network. 
as you can imagine it doesn't have to be ARP request any broadcast message can actually end up with similar situation the next bad thing can happen to our network in the lack of STP and having redundant path is called MAC address table instability so uh, what does it mean it means that uh, this uh, PC for example here has MAC address A and when it sends the traffic to PC2 um, if we have redundant path switch one for example may send the traffic from this interface at one certain point of time and in the other occasion it may send it on the other one so it will confuse this switch if MAC address A exists on this interface or this one so the entry of a mac address table will fluctuate between these two interfaces and if you have access to switch logging you will see that there would be some logs that this mac address has shown up on like gig 00 this mac address has shown up on gig 01 uh, or 01 and 02 etc so it will confuse the switch so switch needs to actually uh, replace the MAC address entry for the, the specific MAC address uh, constantly which actually will cause instability in the, uh, MAC, in the MAC address table and this can happen to any individual MAC addresses. The final bad thing that may happen is called multiple frame transmission. In this scenario if it happens which is actually rarely happening in, uh, in today's switches I mean if, if we had hubs in our network between our switches that would definitely happen but in the new switches and if you have a um, redundant path like this and there's no any hub between our switches it's, it, it will rarely happen but anyway if it happens your destination device whatever it is it will receive um, identical copies of same frame which actually may confuse the destination host, whatever it is. So the, the device needs to make decision to keep um, one frame and actually delete the other one. And this decision making it will be consistent if, if it happens. So it will confuse the, the endpoint or end host, whatever it is. So um, to summarize the bad things, broadcast storms, MAC address table instability and multiple frame transmission. The topology I showed you as, a, as an example in the previous slide is just an example of a closed loop in your network with, when, we, when you have two switches and you have a redundant path. So this is actually a closed loop between your two switches. But that's not the only case. Any closed loop in your layer two infrastructure can end up with those things I mentioned broadcast store multiple frame transmission and MAC address table instability so if you have three switches and you have a closed loop in layer two then that 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 actually ends up here with a similar situation or if you have four switches um, with, a, with a closed loop it will happen again but again I will actually emphasize that a spanning tree protocol in Cisco switches has been implemented per VLAN so if for example in this scenario if one link is in VLAN 1 I mean both end ports are in VLAN 1 and the other interfaces are in VLAN 2 this is not called a, a closed loop in, um, in our uh, Cisco terminology and the spanning tree won't do anything with these two links and those stuff won't happen so bear in mind that this closed loop has to be in a specific VLAN so creates um, those actually chaos that we talked about now let's see how does STP work the first step in a spanning tree protocol process is called root selection so if we have a topology like this one of these switches must become root bridge or root of our spanning tree you may ask why bridge uh, it's a switch because the spanning tree actually protocol introduced 
where actually um, uh, bridges were still exist. So the, the, the terminology is still refers to bridges, but actually we know that bridges are actually obsolete these days and we only have switches. We need to actually uh, have a parameter to um, use it as a factor to make one of these switches a root bridge. And that parameter or factor is called bridge ID or BID in short form. Bridge ID itself consists of two items or two um, sections. The first one is called a priority and which is a two byte uh, section. And the next one is the system ID or the MAC address of the switch. Each switch has a universal, unique, burned in MAC address from the factory. So this MAC address will not actually be identical between any two switches in the world. So, um, and as I mentioned before, uh, Cisco implemented this um, protocol per VLAN. So for Cisco switches, for priority, we have a default value, or whatever it is, and then it will be added to the VLAN ID. I show you a, a STP packet so you can see what, what do I mean. So our bridge ID consists of two parts, priority and the MAC address of the switch. And the priority itself contains a base number and plus the VLAN ID that a spanning tree runs in that VLAN. So for example, if the default value, which is actually it is, uh, the default value is 32768. So for VLAN 1, this priority going to be 32769 for all switches in our network and all the way to all other VLANs. So um, the, the switch that has the lowest bridge ID will become our root bridge. But the question is, how does this root election process work? It doesn't like our um, normal, uh, po like a political polling stuff. So someone said, oh, okay, this is, this is my uh, ID. I, I, I want to be the, the root bridge, etc." By default, all switches assumes they are the root bridges. So what they send in the STP packet says, this is my bridge ID and this is the root bridge ID. And both of them are the same, which means I am the root bridge. As soon and they, they start to send it all on all interfaces that are connected. Once one of the switches or any switch receives a message that has a lower bridge ID in it, it will figure out there is someone else in the network that has a better priority than me. So that switch can become or is a good candidate to become the root bridge. So from now on, whatever or any STP message that is getting out of this switch will say, this is my bridge ID and this is the root bridge ID, which is the bridge ID of the other switch. So again, I mean, from now on, it doesn't introduce itself as the root bridge. And these messages actually going back and forth between the switches until all of them understands who has the lowest bridge ID and introduce that switch in the network as the root bridge. And all of these conversations are happening through STP packets, which we call them BPDU or bridge protocol data units. These messages that are getting transferred between the switches to negotiate about these stuffs are called um, hello BPDU. 
and if any switch receives a stp packet with a lower bridge id in it that message is called um, superior hello superior hello and if any switch receives an stp packet with higher bridge id it is called inferior um, hello message which means that i don't need to actually make any action because of this message because that switch that is sending this message to me has a higher bridge id on my um, uh, over my current bridge id so that switch cannot become my root bridge um, the other thing is uh, obviously as i mentioned uh, the one with the lowest bridge id actually will become the root bridge but uh, how does this thing work well i mean what does a lower bridge id mean the first one or the first factor is priority so if the priority is lower it doesn't matter if the mac address is higher or lower so the first item that is getting checked between the switches is the priority if the priorities are the same which is the case if you don't change it because it has a default value then it goes to the mac address so the switch that has the lowest MAC address, if priorities are identical, will become the root bridge. Now let's have a quick look a sample STP conversation. As I mentioned before, when the root election process starts, all switches believe they are the root bridge and how they introduce it with two fields, root identifier and bridge identifier. Bridge identifier means who am I? This is me, this is my base priority, this is the VLAN ID, and this is my MAC address. And in my opinion, who is the root at the moment? This guy is the root. And as you can see, both uh, items or both fields have the same values, which means I believe I am the root bridge. At the same time, the other switch believes the same thing and it sends the similar information. We can see that here. The MAC address is different. It has one instead of two in it and also the bridge identifier. So the neighboring switch also believe it is the root bridge. Now my switch receives a superior hello, which means someone has a lower bridge ID in the network. So it's the time to make some changes in the network. So we have to actually accept that there is someone else which has a higher priority and we need to start the recalculation based on this new guy. So the switch starts to send a packet which is called TCN or topology change notification as you can see it here. This uh, message is out of CCNA 200301 uh, course. Well, I just mentioned it here to let you know that this is the time that my switch understand something has happened in the network and it has to change the topology and do the recalculations accordingly. And from this moment on, my switch starts to advertise uh, the information with the new actually um, items. So as you can see, my bridge still sends this bridge ID field as previous. So this is my bridge ID, which obviously not gonna change. But in the root identifier field, it introduces the other switch and tells the neighboring devices, this guy, in my opinion, is the root bridge. And as you can see, a root path cost is also advertised, which is four here. I'll be talking about this path cost in a minute. With this packet, the neighboring switch will understand that it can reach out to the root bridge through this device and with this cost. 
and then in the next step where we do the root port calculation it will use these values to calculate the best path to reach out to the root breach these hello messages is actually continuously going back and forth between switches based on a timer which is called hello timer and it is two seconds by default so every two seconds switches will send stp packets on all of their active interfaces to figure out if there is any uh, kind of redundant path topology change in the network a new switch with a lower bridge id has been introduced to the network etc so if you want to have your um, topology consistent you have to manipulate the priorities to make sure that the switch that you want to be always the root bridge will remain the root bridge no matter how many more switches you will bring to your network I will be talking about it in the upcoming videos, how you can change these values. The next step is root port selection for non-root bridges. I mean, for example, if switch one is our root bridge, now it's time for switch two, three and four to pick one of the best interfaces to reach out the root bridge. And call it root port how do they do that they do it based on a cost the cost of a path to the root bridge one of the fields in stp packet is cost so whenever for example switch 4 sends the stp message to switch 3 it says if this is my bridge id this is the root bridge id which is switch one for now and this is the cost this is the cost if you want to reach out to root bridge from my side or from my path okay and this process starts from the root bridge so the first messages that goes out of root bridge it says if you want to reach out to me the root cost is zero because i'm the root bridge so you don't have to pay any cost to reach out to me because i am the root bridge so when this switch receives this message calculates the cost of this interface for example it is four and add it to the advertised value which is zero so it figures out if he wants to reach out to switch on this port the cost gonna be four and similar process happens here switch one sends this to switch three and switch three says okay it's four for me to reach out to switch one as well and when it advertises the value it says if you want to reach out to root through my path or through me the cost gonna be four and then switch four again adds this value to the value or the cost of this interface for example let's assume that it is still four and it becomes eight and then again it advertises the value to switch two it says if you want to reach out to root bridge through me your cost gonna be eight and then again switch two will calculate the cost so it says okay i have eight from switch four and i have four to go to switch four so the cost to reach out to the root bridge is 12 if i want to go through switch 4 and now switch 2 has two values or two paths with different costs one cost is 4 and the other cost is 12 so obviously my switch actually selects this path and this port gonna be root port on switch 2 
okay? You may ask, okay, where does this um, cost values coming from? These values are coming from a predefined values. They are default values for each type of interface, which I'll show you in the next um, slide. Each interface, based on its speed, has a cost. I mean, 10 megs, 100 megs, 1 gig, 10 G, 100, uh, sorry, uh, 25 G, 40 G, 100 G, 1 terabits, etc. Any of them has a default value. You can change these values, but it's not recommended. The, the higher bandwidth the interface has, the lower cost it will be introduced. So for example, if this interface is a 100 meg, and these, all of these interfaces are like 10G interfaces, your eventual situation might be different. I mean, although this path in, in our view might be closer because it's just one hop away, but based on the STP calculation, this path might be better because it has lower cost. No matter how many switches we need to go through to reach out to the root bridge. So it is always recommended to actually uh, populate your uh, spanning topology yourself and tweak these values to actually make um, a switch, not, not, not the costs, actually the priorities mainly to actually build your uh, desired layer two topology in terms of a spanning tree. I copied this table from a Cisco official set guide. So as you can see, the values has changed over time because actually the capacity of interfaces have been increased significantly over time. So initially, um, uh, 10 megs interfaces cost was 100 and then 100 megs, 19, 4, 2, and uh, the value for 100 gigs and 1 terabits per second was um, not actually uh, determined. So they had to change it when these interfaces introduced. So they changed the values after 2004 to for 10 megs to 2 million, for 100 megs, 200,000, 20,000, 2,000, 220. So now the cost calculation will be happening based on these new values on Cisco switches. Important phase of STP process is determining the designated port. Let's assume that switch one is the root bridge. And now switch two determines this port as the root port. This one is root port for switch three. And this one is the root port for switch four. Now we have the last redundant path that needs to be blocked. Or we have to figure out what to do with this interface. In each network segment, we have to determine the designated port. So it's all about, the thing is, when we say we block the port, it, it means that the port actually blocks on one end, but STP packets still can go through that interface. So switch knows about what's going on in the network, but not any other protocol or data. It's, it's, um, only STP will be allowed on that specific interface. The interface that has the lower cost will have the designated port. And within this scenario, switch three will have that lower cost. So here, this interface will become designated port and this interface will be blocked or goes to blocking state, which we will be talking about the states in the next video. So from now on, all of the STP packet goes out of this one. This switch will receive the STP messages on this blocking interface and processes them, but not any other protocols or data. So with this scenario, 
This interface is not creating a loop in our network anymore and we have a loop free topology. There might be some situations that parameters we have spoken about them so far are not adequate to handle the situation. For example, if we have uh, a scenario like this, we have two switches. Let's assume that switch one is the root bridge and now switch two has to uh, figure out which of these two interfaces gonna be picked up as the, the root port. Let's assume that everything is the same, like both of them are gigabit ethernet, all priorities, etc., are the same. So the cost of reaching to root via this interface is exactly identical to this one. It may happen in other scenarios as well. When you have identical path cost to reach to the root bridge. What shall we do in these circumstances? In these circumstances, we are using port ID or port identifier. Port identifier consists of um, um, a priority like bridge ID, which I believe it's 128 by default, and then the number which is the number of the interface if and it actually numbers sequentially if our interfaces are numbered from 0 1 to 16 this number going to be 1 2 3 4 5 up to 16 etc okay so for example for this port it's going to be 128.1 if it's gigabit ethernet 0 slash 1 for example and for this one, it's going to be 128.2, okay? So in this situation, if the cost is the same, now port ID will actually be kicking in and switch will pick this interface as the root port because it has a lower port identifier. Alright guys, sorry if this video is a bit longer than the previous ones because as I mentioned, STP has a lot of details that we need to cover. I wish you enjoyed today's video. 